So welcome everyone um, and I hope everyone had a great Easter. As you can tell, spring is here, so thank you for joining us from sunny Manchester for our quarterly markets update, um, being presented by Alex Brandreth, as usual, Chief Investment Officer from Lima Investment Management. Since the last quarterly update in January, and we also had an interim markets update um, after the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. Uh, we've seen an increase in volatility in the markets from all asset classes that Alex will touch on. And I'm sure some of you will have received the 10% market drop letter. Just to reassure you, this isn't uncommon when there's some market volatility. Um, and we can't stress enough and reiterate the idea about focusing on clients' long-term objectives and not just short-term short excuse me, market volatility. Although we do have to be mindful uh, mindful of these. So the presentation today, Alex will be looking at inflation and the impact on the cost of living on markets, the impact of the Russia-Ukrainian conflict. Alex will touch on what's happened with COVID in the UK briefly, as it's uh, we've seen a resurgence of some of the COVID rates. Thankfully, not no one uh, there's not as many people going into a hospital. Looking at how we maximise um, investing in this environment. And we'll also touch upon looking at time in the markets and not just timing of the markets. Just before we start, some housekeeping and uh, to mitigate any background noise, everyone should be on mute. Um, so just to check, the presentation is being recorded and will be on social media. The webinar will last around 40 minutes with questions and answers at the end, and these can be taken by the Q&A button on the Zoom screen below. So without further ado, I'd like to pass you over to Alex Brandreth, Chief Investment Officer from Luna. Thank you very much, Stuart, and hope everyone's well and had a, had a lovely Easter as well. Um, it's definitely been an interesting quarter for markets um, with, with investors suddenly worried at the start of the year about interest rates and where inflation was. As Stuart touched on, the, the, the sad events of Russia invading Ukraine had another, um, well, obviously a humanitarian crisis, but an impact on markets as well. Uh, and then in March, you saw stock markets recover, uh, bouncing from their lows. Um, so we're going we're gonna to go through the reasons for all this, how different asset classes have been impacted during this environment, uh, and just... As I said, if, if there is any uh, questions, as Stuart said, please feel free to uh, ask them as we're going through. So I'm going to start sharing my screen now. We can go formally through the, the slides. There we go. Stuart's already touched on what we're going to go through today in terms of um, cost of living, the impact of Russia on markets, and, and how to invest in this backdrop. Just before we go into all that, I think it's worthwhile just spending a few minutes just introducing Luna and explaining who we are and, and what we do. So Luna uh, is an appointed representative of a company called Thornbridge. Uh, essentially, they provide our regulatory commissions and compliance. It was a very quick way of Luna becoming um, active in trading when we started just over two years ago now. All we do is discretionary management. Uh, we are based in, in sunny Manchester, as we touched on earlier. What discretionary management means is that if a client entrusts us to uh, manage money on their behalf, then we can make decisions without informing them and asking their permission. For example, um, if we decided now was a good time to be investing in Tesco, um, we, could, we could do that on a client's behalf and we don't ask to have to ask for the client if, we, if it's okay if we buy Tesco. As you can see from my gray hairs uh, and the, the Luna website, um, there is a number of uh, individuals at Luna that have a huge amount of experience of managing portfolios, um, investment markets, client uh, journey, compliance, um, portfolio management, etc. Uh, we've got a very well resourced team and that team is actually continuing to grow over the course of this year. So what do we do? Um, we've got three core services at Luna. Bespoke portfolios, they are truly bespoke. So if you have any individual needs or requirements, whether that be ethical or um, income requirements, or you want to avoid certain asset classes, then we build that portfolio specifically for you, our client. Outside of that, uh, we also offer a model portfolio service, which is only available via a financial advisor like Pareto. And we also offer an AIM portfolio service which means that you go away and you buy individual AIM companies. Now, AIM companies are smaller businesses. 
but they are also well-known businesses as well. So a good example of an AIM company would be Jet2, the airline and holiday operator. They just happen to be listed on the AIM market and not the main FTSE 100 or London Stock Exchange market. And after holding those companies for two years, they're therefore outside of your estate for inheritance tax planning. So it's a good inheritance tax planning tool that is used by financial planners uh, for, for people um, who have an inheritance tax issue. And you know, we are delighted that despite the fact that uh, Luna has been only going for, for just over two years now, um, the individuals, the services, the software, um, the processes that we have in place have been reviewed and analysed by de facto as a third party representative. And we've been given this expert rated for, for two of the three services that we provide. They actually don't provide a rating for the AIM portfolio service, and, and that's why we haven't gone for that. So that's enough about us. Um, this uh, one of the most common questions that we're getting at the moment is the cost of living. It's why is my why are fuel prices going up so much? Why is my mobile phone go, uh, phone bill going up so much? What's going on with energy prices? That's certainly having an impact, and and all of those put together is pushing inflation up. Um, at the same time, where wages and whether that be individuals or whether that be pensions. Uh, are not increasing at the same same rate and that's created um well this <laughs> this is a section taken from the bbc website so you know it's serious when the bbc have got a dedicated section to it but you can see that, that there is a number of different factors which are contributing to to push up inflation at the moment and we'll, we'll touch on that uh, later some of the common ones are, are food prices energy prices and oil prices and they're certainly having a big impact on on inflation so what is going on with inflation? This is consumer price inflation, CPI. Um, this chart goes all the way back to 2011. So just over, just over 10 years of track record here. And you can see how inflation has ebbed and flowed over the previous 10 years. When we were coming out the financial crisis, um, inflation started to surge. In fact, when you're coming out of recession, you do tend to see inflation starting to pick up. And one of the reasons for that is because demand is increasing. Demand is increasing significantly, which means that uh, the cost of goods increases. And that's exactly why right at the beginning of this chart here, you can see inflation was around 5% when we came out of the recession of, of 2009, 2010. Since then, and this is quite crucial at the moment, and it's just worthwhile being mindful of this, you can see how inflation slowly fell away over the last five years. We then had Brexit and the impact on sterling, which meant that inflation picked up. But then again, inflation fell away, um, particularly during COVID, because again, whilst demand being positive can have a positive impact on demand, demand being weak, um, which it was in COVID because we weren't going out, we weren't consuming, we weren't going to restaurants, pushed down inflation. Whereas now you can see that inflation has really taken off over the last year or so. Now, on the next slide, we've got a few few different uh, rationale behind that. I've already touched on some of them, but this this number here was the highest number um, of seven percent going back to when the national statistics actually started. It's the highest inflation figure for thirty years. And whilst this is consumer price inflation, and that's running at seven percent. There's also retail price inflation, which is another inflationary um, calculation, which is done by the Bank of England. Uh, sorry, by the Naf Office of National Statistics. And that's running at 9%. Now, some, um, some operators, some different firms actually use retail price inflation to push through higher prices. Um, I've got an O2 uh, mobile phone and they quoted the uh, retail price inflation for their most recent increase in costs. So there are <clears throat> inflationary pressures which are going through, which are greater than the 7% CPI number that's coming through. Now, investors, uh, commentators are really good at telling you what's happened. <clears throat> they don't really concentrate too much on what's going to happen. And that's what I want to spend a couple of minutes doing now. Now, <clears throat> inflation predicted by the Bank of England, by economists, is expected to increase over the next month or two. It's probably going to hit 8% uh, consumer price inflation. So it's going to expect this to carry on going for another month or two. That being said, inflation is an annual calculation. 
it looks at the prices a year ago to the prices where we are today. And the annual impact at the moment is pretty high, and hence why they have a high inflationary number. But the, in, the number from uh, 2021 is going to start increasing as commodity prices increase. What does that mean? That means that inflation should start to fall after uh, April, May time. So inflation uh, as an annual calculation will, will still start to fall. There's one caveat to that though, um, and that's the energy prices. Energy prices are set, as we now know, on a six monthly basis, April and October. And if the natural gas price stays where it is today, um, then it could easily be possible that you see another increase in energy bills in October. That being said, I mean, there's still a lot of different factors that can in fact in influence that number. Clearly, the, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine will, and I can explain why that is later. But there's, there's other um, demand supply of energy, weather, etc., which will have an impact on, on the energy price uh, in October. Now, what this chart shows is it actually breaks down the different parts of inflation and shows you know, what is contributing to this high level of inflation within the UK. Is it one factor? Is it several factors? And you can see here that there's, there's nine factors um, which contribute to, to inflation. This chart only goes back to March 2020 at the beginning of the pandemic. And you can see the different factors that have been influencing it over the course of the last year or so, or two years. The ones I want to highlight really, which are the biggest contributing factors is this green bar here, which is uh, energy bills. It's house, housing and household services. So we all know that the energy price um, has, our energy bills have been increasing. You can see that within this figure here. And that number is one and a half percent. So one and a half percent of the 7% is of inflation at the moment is being driven by, by energy costs. The next biggest contributor is this kind of maroony color here, which is transport. And what that effectively means is it's the oil price. It's the cost for, for traveling. It's, it's filling, up the, filling up at the pump. Um, as we've already touched on, March was a, a record month for pe petrol and diesel prices within the UK and one of the largest monthly jumps on record. But it's not just those two factors. You can see all of the factors, all of the different uh, inputs into inflation are all positive at the moment, all nine of them. Um, clothing and footwear, which is this kind of purpley number, that is the biggest annual increase in clothing and footwear, footwear on record. So it doesn't look a lot, but it's a big impact. Again, that's because of supply side problems, but it's also to do with uh, commodity prices increasing as well. The next uh, biggest contributor is furniture and household goods. Again, it's that kind of goldy color. It's never really had an impact at all when you're looking at inflation over the last two years, but suddenly because of the fact that commodity prices are increasing, because of the fact that the oil prices increase to a certain extent, it's starting to have a factor and an impact on in terms of inflation. And the last one, which has really had an impact is re recreation and, and culture, which is this kind of pinky line here or pinky dot square, sorry. And you can, again, you can see that that started to increase more so than it ever has done in the past. So it's not just one thing. It's not just um, our energy bills that's not are going up. It's not just the cost of the, of the pump. There are so many different factors which are contributing to the increase in inflation at the moment. Now, one of the common things to do when, it, when inflation is, is moving up is for the Bank of England to look to increase interest rates to try and rein that in. And this chart goes all the way back to the 1970s to show the different impact of, of interest or different level of interest rates over time. I mentioned the fact that the last time inflation was this high was 30 years ago, which was in 1992. And you can see the interest rates at the time were around 10%. So we have the same level of in inflation today as we did in 1992, but interest rates then were 10% and today they're 0.75%. So the Bank of England have increased interest rates three times at the last three meetings, December, February, and in March, which has moved them to 0.75%. Interest rates will continue to move higher over the course of the next year or two but they're not going to get to the levels of say 10% um, that they have in the past. 
they're not even going to get to the levels that we were pre-financial crisis of five or six percent. And the rationale for that is because the UK debt situation is the worst it's been for 55 years. We have more debt as a percentage of GDP now than, than we, we have done in the past. And that's um, only been exceeded in times of war. So the U that means that the UK economy, um, the UK government are more sensitive than they ever have been uh, to an increase in interest rates. So a 1% increase in interest rates now means that the UK government have to find 25 billion in extra debt interest payments. That is clearly not a small uh, and insignificant number. And when the government is one of the biggest employers in the UK as well, then there's clearly other uses that they can have um, than just paying on interest payments. That's where we where we are in terms of interest rates. So interest rates will be moving higher um, to maybe one and a half or two percent. But as I said, they definitely won't be moving to the levels that they have been in, in the past. And I think there's a there's a, a tendency to think this is just happening in the UK um, because we were based in the UK and that's definitely not the case. Um, interest rates globally have started to move higher. Um, in the US, interest rates have already moved higher, um, not, not, not yet in, in Europe, um, but interest rates globally are starting to move higher because the, it's not just the UK that's seeing these high levels of inflation and, and, um, invest in, and central bankers are looking to control that as much as possible. Now, why won't interest rates go up significantly? I've mentioned the fact that um, we already have so much debt, but one of the other reasons is there's not really a lot the Bank of England can do about this type of inflation. It's commodity price inflation which is coming through. The Bank of England can't control what's going on with the oil price. The Bank of England can't control what's going on with the natural gas price. So interest rates are going up because the thing that they can control is, is consumer confidence and, and potentially wage inflation. So if wage inflation becomes entrenched within the UK, then that can have a significant impact um, and future inflation and keep inflation higher for longer. And that's why the Bank of England are increasing interest rates. They're not increasing interest rates now because of what's going on with commodities. They're increasing interest rates now because they're worried about the long-term impact inflation being embedded into the system. It's not all bad news. Uh, I appreciate we've been talking about what's been going on from inflation and it's, it's definitely feeling a squeeze and, and that's why uh, we have costs of living uh, splashed everywhere at the moment. Um, some positives. So the UK unemployment rate is currently 3.7%. Um, this chart goes back all the way to the 1970s. And you can see that that's pretty much at the low. Uh, UK unemployment is at the lowest it's been for, for 50 odd years. Um, the COVID spike in unemployment was, was very mild. And that's a function of the fact that the furlough scheme was there to support and stop employees um, going through redundancy. If it hadn't been there, it, it's likely that unemployment would have been back to the levels of, of the financial crisis. That being said, you can see how strong the recovery has been. It's been one of the quickest recoveries in the employment market that, we, that we've seen. Um, and again, that's not just the case with the UK, that's, that's globally as well. And just on that point, uh, on the right hand chart here, you can see job vacancies. <clears throat> this has got the UK in this blue line. It's got the US in the, in the black line and Germany in the purple line. And you can see 20 odd years of history. So going back to the early 2000s, that job vacancies have never been as high uh, in the UK and US um, over the last 20 years. And that's a function of the fact that the labor market has definitely squeezed. People have taken early retirement. People have left the workforce to look after uh, relatives. Um, people have left the UK uh, as well, obviously because of Brexit and, and returning, returning back to the EU. So that's definitely had an impact on in terms of the actual labor pool within the UK, um, which, is, which is causing a, a squeeze on employment. And back to what I said earlier and what the Bank of England increased in interest rates, you are seeing a little bit of wage inflation coming through. So wage inflation in March was running at 5.4%. So that 5.4% is clearly significantly lower uh, than the 7% that inflation is running at, which means that financially we are feeling slightly worse off at the moment because of the impact of inflation. 
Again, um, something that we've been very mindful of is the excess savings, the excess wealth that individuals have accumulated because of COVID. So on the chart on the left hand side here, you can see as a percentage of GDP, well, what does that actually mean? Now, we haven't been able to go on holiday. Uh, we haven't been able to go out significantly. I appreciate that's changed a little bit more recently, but for two years, it's been significantly limited. Um, individuals have paid down loans. Individuals have paid down mortgages. Uh, savings ratios are a lot higher. Um, and that's meant that within the UK, it's around 10% of the economy is, is, in, the, is in the household, is in, is in bank accounts, uh, which is a significant number. In the US, that's slightly higher, and it's, it's not as good in the Eurozone, which means that when energy prices are going up, when the cost of petrol is going up, when the cost of a flight's going up uh, to go on holiday, hotels, et cetera, it means that we have the excess savings to be able to maintain that. Now, clearly that situation can't last forever, but it means that we're going into this cost of living crisis with the UK consumer in a very healthy situation. One of the common questions that we're getting at the moment is because of inflation, because of what's going on with Russia, because of other external factors and, and COVID, et cetera, are we going into recession? And the answer to that at the moment, as we look at the statistics and the data is no. On the left-hand side, you can see where we are from an economic growth perspective, and, and this is globally. China is, is slowing. Um, Chinese, uh, Chinese are going through a period of restrictions. And when you go through a period of restrictions because of COVID, it impacts economic growth. So, so Chinese growth is slowing, but you can see that it's been very strong for a very long period of time, which is that orange line there from, from back to 2006. You've then got the US. The US is now back on the trajectory that it was pre-COVID. Um, the UK is catching up. Uh, the UK is now, economy is now bigger than it was before the pandemic. And Europe, is, Europe has been lagging uh, and, and probably will lag a little bit more because of the proximity to, to Russia. On the right hand side, what I wanted to show here is, well, what were economists thinking at the beginning of the year and, and what are they thinking now? So the blue bars show what everyone was expecting or economists were expecting for economic growth in different regions um, over the course of, of, of this year. We're now a quarter in. So what are people thinking now? So that's these green bars. And I want to focus in on the UK uh, because that's where, where we're all based. And you can see that at the beginning of the year, economic growth uh, was expected to be about 4.7% uh, in the UK's case. With inflation picking up because of the conflict, that's now expected that the UK economy will grow by 4% this year. Now, what does that 4% mean? Well, the UK economy in good times tends to grow by about 2%. So what we're saying here is the UK economy is gonna grow by double uh, a normal year. And that's because you've still got this COVID bounce back coming through. Uh, and we're gonna have a, a full year of it this year. It's important to remember the last year, um, we, we still had restrictions in place for, for the first quarter or so as well. So that you know, we didn't have the full benefit of a, uh, no restrictions being in place. Now, clearly that situation can change and we've, we've been through this enough over the last two or so years to know what COVID is very unpredictable. But at the moment, as we sit here today with the current government policy, um, that shows that the economic growth from the UK can continue to bounce back. Now, again, it's not just expected within the UK. You can see that global growth this year has now been revised down. The IMA, IMF actually came out with some statistics um, yesterday, which said that globally, they expect the global economy to grow by 3.6% this year. <coughs> Excuse me, that number has been revised down by 4.4%, which they had at the beginning of the year. So in, global institutions are expecting that growth will be weaker this year because of the impact on inflation and because of the uh, impact of Russia. But it's not going to be a recessionary environment, and that should provide some comfort to, to yourselves. Now, I want to, it's a real shame that we have to talk about this because I, you know, I prefer not to talk about humanitarian crisis and war during a presentation um, because it's, it doesn't, doesn't help anyone and it's very sad, the events that are going on at the moment. But our job as investors is to understand you know, the impact that that's having. So uh, I'm going to touch on the impact on markets, uh, but clearly, you know, there's, there's, it's a very sad environment that we're going through at the moment. 
The first thing to highlight is you know, the increase in the oil price, the increase in natural gas price, etc., is because Russia and, and Ukraine produce a lot of different commodities. And we've got a chart, the next page has got a chart on just what um, is produced in those nations. That's meant uh, commodity prices, commodity companies have done very well. As the price of the commodity has gone up, the, the, the actual uh, cost of production has stayed the same, which means that those companies are making more profits. So their share prices should go up. And that's why you've seen BP Shell, but also mining companies perform very strongly this year. As we've touched on, um, further increases in inflation, further increases, uh, sorry, further increases in commodity prices will only continue to push up inflation. And that caused investor nervousness in February. We actually did um, this, this special uh, webinar in, on the 4th of March. And what we said at the time was, please don't concentrate too much at the short term. Please concentrate on your long-term objectives. And the reason we did that is because we've seen this several times in the past. We've seen markets suffer from events. Uh, we've seen markets uh, under pressure from wars in the past. And what tends to happen in that environment is the market, stock markets, fall in anticipation and in the early uh, days of those events. But suddenly, investors' mindset changes. Investors' mindset now is focusing on when's the war going to come to an end. We know that this environment is going on. In the past, it was an unknown environment. And that's meant that stock markets have recovered. It can be very uncomfortable at times to be invested, and we fully uh, accept that and understand that. Um, but some of the best returns that you can make are actually when you feel the most uncomfortable. We saw this in COVID. Um, for those of you who heard the story, I apologize because I tend to mention it quite a lot. But the low in, lower the stock market during COVID was the 23rd of March, 2020. The day that Boris Johnson stood up to say that the UK was going into a national lockdown was the 23rd of March, 2020. That means that stock markets bottomed at the worst possible point. They bottomed when, at the, when we knew the fact that they were going into lockdown. And then as soon as we we're in that environment, stock markets started to recover because they were looking through that. They were looking through to restrictions being eased and a new environment. And that's exactly what's happened this time as well. Uh, markets bottomed when, the, when Russia had invaded the Ukraine a few weeks afterwards. That tends to happen with investment markets. And that's why we did that special webinar. That's why we did um, the presentations during COVID two years ago, because we know that's the case. Um, it happens, it's happened so many times over history. And our job as investors is to remind, remind yourself of that and try, and try and keep calm because some of the best returns that you can make can actually be uh, in that environment. Bonds are a safe haven asset. People invest in bonds to, to, for security. And when um, tensions are increasing, bond markets are seen and, and investors go to, to, to bonds for safety. But they, they, up, they work in the reverse of stock markets. So the low of the stock market was actually the high of the bond market. And bond market prices have actually started to come off in, in March. It's almost the exact reverse that you've seen within the equity market. So why are commodity prices more volatile? What's, what's been happening? And this chart here just shows um, what does Russia actually produce as a percentage of, of global production. Uh, and then the numbers at the top there are clearly the most impacted commodities. Palladium, which goes into catalytic converters and other, other, other metals, has clearly been the most impacted with 44% of global production of palladium coming from, coming from Russia. But there's not just uh, palladium which is impacted. You can see that natural gas, uh, natural gas, fertilizers, platinum, crude oil, or other significant impacts. Nickel actually stopped change, uh, trading on the London Metal Exchange uh, in March because of the events that were going on. Most commodities are going through a period of volatility. Where does it matter? Now, from a proximity perspective, it matters the most in the EU. 38% of imports from the EU in terms of natural gas are from Russia. Oil and fertilizers, 23 and 28%. That's why you're seeing food price inflation. And whilst it's also important to concentrate on what Russia do as a massive commodity producer, 
the Ukraine have certainly have a global impact in terms of the wheat production. They have 12% of the EU imports of, of, of wheat um, from the Ukraine. So it, it matters what's going on at the moment because it's pushing through food and um, commodity price inflation. And look, I think we all want an end to this war for the humanitarian consequences that we're going through most importantly. Wow, we've got halfway through this presentation and we haven't touched on COVID yet. Um, now, this is taken from, uh, from the government website, uh, just touches on the, the, the four key metrics um, that we look at for, for COVID within the UK. Now, I think the, the, the most important factor to remember is, is things are changing. Um, the virus tests conducted are falling through the floor. The number of people taking tests at the moment are, are declining rapidly which means that the people testing positively is also going to be impacted by that as well. So, sorry. So this left and right hand chart now, in my view, are going to be less and less important going forward because people aren't testing. Um, why aren't people testing? Well, because one, you have to pay for a test now. Uh, and two, because the government have said, well, it doesn't matter if you've got COVID restrictions are, are eased and you can go about your normal day. So you are seeing that this relaxation of, of policy is, has meant that tests are, are falling through the floor. So the most important data to look at now from a COVID perspective is one, uh, how many patients are admitted and, and two, again, sadly, how many people have been dying from COVID still. The good news, uh, the number of patients being admitted into hospital continue is, is declined. You can see it was picking up in, in March and April as we had the Omicron variant still coming through and that was the reason for the increase in December. Um, and that has led to an increase in, in sadly in deaths through, through March and early April. But you can see there that that trend should start to, to fall away. And that's what we're expecting to see within, within the UK. Now, again, it matters what's going on within the UK um, and it matters to all of us, but it's also just as important from an investment perspective to be aware of what's going on globally. And what's going on globally is that vaccination rates are significantly behind the UK. Uh, vaccination rates are increasing globally, but then they're, they're, they're not to the level that they are in the UK. Um, and you are seeing restrictions. So you're seeing restrictions at the moment within Shanghai in China who, because of this zero COVID policy. And that is impacting, again, global supply chains. Um, that is going to impact the, the manufacture of goods in those countries, which are then brought over here and, and globally as well. So COVID, despite the fact that we, we don't talk about it as much, uh, and it's later on in the presentation now, it still matters. Um, it still matters from... Um, a variant perspective, it still matters from a strength of vaccine perspective, and other countries are going through periods of restrictions which will ultimately impact us. So I think investors still need to be very mindful of the impact that, that COVID can have, uh, and we'll touch on, on that in a second as well when we look at the performance of Asian stock markets over this quarter. So, so how do you invest in an, an environment when you've got inflation picking up, You've got interest rates moving higher. You've got volatile. You've got higher commodity prices. You've got uh, conflict, uh, etc. So I think the first place to look at is, is where we've been. Government bonds have been the weakest uh, this year. This, this shows that UK government bonds and UK corporate bonds have fallen by about seven and a half percent this quarter, and that's because as inflation picks up and the interest rates move higher those bond prices move lower to reflect that. A bond that was bought six months ago at, when interest rates are 0.1% is not worth as much today with interest rates at 0.75%. You can buy something cheap, better today with a better return than you could six months ago. That's why bond prices have been under pressure. It's not just corporate and, and government bonds that have been under pressure. You can see that we can buy strategic bond funds, which have the ability to go anywhere within fixed income markets. They've done slightly better. Emerging market bonds have been under pressure because of the impact of, of Russia and the threat of uh, contagion within emerging markets as well. So that's certainly been an area which has been weak. So there's really been no hiding place this quarter from a fixed income bond perspective. 
has there been any hiding in place from an investment perspective in equity markets? Well, the only stock, major stock market that has delivered a positive return this year is, is the FTSE 100, which is up 3%. And we've got a chart later which explains why that's the case. It hasn't been all good news for UK investors in the UK stock market. The FTSE 250, which invests in the next uh, 250 biggest companies within the UK, was down by around 10% this quarter. So you can see that was actually significantly lower than, than most markets. And that's because these businesses are, are smaller, they're more impacted by growth, uh, and also um, because they have less commodity exposure. Within the US and the S&P 500, the stock market was down by about 2% in the first quarter. Some of the falls there were driven what was going on with the technology sector. So the technology sector was down by over 6% during the month. So the NASDAQ sector was down here. Um, and technology is a big weighting within, within US stock markets. The reason why technology companies were weaker in the first quarter is because these are seen, again, as more growth oriented businesses. They are earning profits in the future. And as interest rates move higher, that means that those profits are worth less in real terms today. And that means that share prices move lower. And that's exactly what you've seen recently. Europe uh, was the worst affected area from a stock market perspective in the first quarter. And that was a function of facts of proximity. Location matters um, during periods of conflict. The closer you are to the conflict, the more stock markets, the more currencies fell. Um, and Europe, from a proximity perspective, is clearly closer to where the, the, the issues are and, and European stock markets were weaker, as well as the fact that Europe is more reliant on, on Russia than, than other global nations. But as you can see from Asian markets, whether it be the Hong Kong stock market, which is the Hang Seng, or Nikkei, markets were weaker there as well. Uh, Hang Seng, the, the Hong Kong stock market, as I said, would have been impacted by the COVID restrictions by China during the period as well. So why is the FTSE 100 uh, performed so much better than the S&P 500 this year? And it, what, what it really boils down to is, is the makeup of the market. So on the left hand side here, you can see the sector makeup of the FTSE 100. And I've highlighted three major sectors there financials, so banks, insurance companies, asset managers, materials, energy. Um, so materials would be a Glencore, a Rio Tinto. Energy would be BP and Shell. And you can see that they have significant um, weightings within, within the UK stock market. It's about 40% of, of, of the UK stock market is invested in those three sectors. And the environment for the FTSE 100 has been very strong this year. We've already touched on what's happened with commodity prices. Commodity prices being higher, um, cost of production staying the same means that the profits for those businesses go up. But banks also do well in a raising interest rate environment, which is the environment that we've been in uh, this year and looks likely to be the environment that we're in, importantly, for the rest of this year. Whereas on the right-hand side, you can see that the S&P 500 has the biggest sector in technology. So we all know who those companies are. It's your Apples, your Facebooks, your Microsofts, your Googles of this world. They have big allocations. Those companies have done fantastically well over the last five and 10 years, which has meant the weighting of technology has only increased to the highest ever level um, within the S&P 500. And when interest rates are going up and growth is, is people are concerned about growth, then those companies become under more pressure. Also, there's, you know, there's an argument that they have done so well, so there's definitely a bit of profit taking gone on within these businesses. But you can see, and on the flip side, the allocation or the holdings in financials is, is significantly lower. Materials is very low and, and energy is low. So compared to the UK, where there's 40 odd percent in those markets, the, the S&P has, has only got a roughly 20 percent. So the UK has got double the weight in, in in those three sectors. And on the flip side for the UK, there's not really any technology businesses within the UK. Um, so it hasn't had the same impact that you've seen from, from technology companies coming under pressure. One of the biggest com conversations that we have with investors at the moment is inflation is at 7%. It's probably going to increase to over 8% in the coming months. 
but I'm getting 0.75% for the Bank of England. What do I do with my, with my money? Um, and that is a, that's a problem that people are talking about now. But as this chart shows, this has been a problem for, for 10 years or so because interest rates have been low for a long period of time and inflation has been gradually eating away at people's savings. So this is a 10 year chart. So going back to, to 2012 uh, to where we are today. And there's a 30% difference between inflation, which is retail price inflation in this instance, versus what you can get at the bank. 30% over 10 years is, is a huge number. And that's gradually been compounded and eroded away, away over time. And it's, it's, this is one of the biggest challenges we have from an investment perspective at the moment. This is why we're talking to more clients than, than we have done about you know, what are you doing with your cash? Are you making your cash work? Because in real terms, it's being, uh, being eroded. And that is exactly what financial repression is. Uh, so it's a huge gap and it's the biggest gap that we've seen between inflation and interest rates right now. So something definitely to be mindful of. And you can see here that that's only accelerating over the last year or so because of what's been going on. One of the most important charts and one of the um, key messages that I want to get across today is we spent a lot of time talking about what's happened over a quarter. We spent a lot of time talking about the different impacts that's going on right now. But we and yourself should be uh, long-term investors. We should be riding through these periods of volatility. Um, we should be looking to take advantage of opportunities that present themselves when we go through periods of, of, of volatility. And that's exactly what we've been doing here at Luna. And that's what you should expect from your investment manager. We are at our busiest during times like this because we can find good quality businesses at cheaper prices. And what this, what this chart shows is going back all the way to, the, to 1945, um, the performance of the FTSE All Share, the, 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 the UK stock market, and the returns that you generated over those time periods. The green bars or the green uh, bit of the chart here show the, the different bull markets. You can see the percentage return of the different bull markets. In black, you can see how long they last. And on the, underneath the chart, you can see the different bear markets that we've had uh, and how often, uh, you know, what the falls have been when we've gone into a bear market and how long the bear market tends to last. The last bear market we saw uh, was, was COVID. So this is February and March. You can see it was only a couple of months, but the stock market fell by about 25%. On average, a bear market lasts just over a year. So it was a shorter bear market. And what I wanted to highlight, though, is, is the good, good news, the good side of this. This current market, bull market that we're in, is very small compared to, to previous bull markets. We're about just over two years into this bull market, uh, two years and one month, to be precise. Uh, and you can see that the average bull market lasts for just under six years. Now, who knows if this is going to be an average cycle? Is this going to be longer or shorter than others? Um, clearly, the 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 effects of the last few months with inflation and Russia have, have maybe pushed that bull market slightly shorter. But that being said, um, economic growth this year within the UK is, is going to be a, a, a double year at 4% or potentially a double year at 4%. So economic growth is, is still positive, which is still a, a strong period to be invested in, in equities. The last time that we had inflation running at 10%, was in 1992. And you can see how strong the equity market, the UK market was in that environment. That bull market lasted for just under 13 years. And if you'd invested right at the bottom to, and then sold out right at the top, you would have made five over nearly six times your money, 571% return from your investment. At the moment, we're only from the bottom of the market in March, 2020, the FTSE is only up 42%. And the FTSE has actually been a, a laggard compared to other global markets over the last two years. Yes, it's had a good quarter, but the FTSE uh, has lagged other global markets. Um, so there's definitely some catch up to, to come. Now, the important part of this chart as well is, is, is the power of investing over time and the compounding impact that I can have. Over this time period, we've gone through wars, we've gone through oil crises, we've gone through bubbles. We've had shocks to the financial system, financial crises, um, COVID. Now, we, 
markets and investors go through a lot of challenges all the time. It's just what we have to deal with day on a day-to-day -day business, day -to day-to-day basis. Companies evolve, businesses evolve, and more importantly, individuals evolve to the environment that we're in. So we're just up on time now for the formal presentation. So I just wanted to conclude with a few final remarks. Clearly, it's very, very sad uh, what's going on in the Ukraine. Um, and from a, from a growth perspective, as we've touched on, that's, how, that's impacted global growth this year. And that is going to keep inflation higher uh, and higher for longer. Inflation, though, is probably peaked now. Inflation within the UK will likely start to fall from, from the summer. Oh, sorry, something's gone a bit wrong there. From an investment perspective, what do you do? Well, when you've got inflation running very high, then government bonds and cash, which have got very low yields, make are very unattractive asset classes. Um, so we've had a very low allocation to them, which has helped protect portfolios this year. As I said, bond markets have been some of the worst performers in the first quarter. The foot, on the flip side, because of the exposure to commodities, the FTSE 100 has been one of the best global stock markets um, since the turn this year. And with, within Luna, we do have a bias within the UK. We feel the UK has been disliked, hated um, since, since the Brexit referendum in, in 2016, and which left the UK uh, equity market looking significantly cheaper compared to other global markets. And despite the fact that the UK has had a slightly better quarter, it hasn't changed that impact. The UK still looks good value. We get a lot of questions um, during periods of volatility, and that's absolutely right. But this is what we're here to do. We're here to speak to you. We're here to tell you what we're doing during periods like this. But what I would say is please don't concentrate too much on the short term because it can feel uncomfortable going through periods of volatility like this, but we've been here before. We've seen financial crises, we've seen COVID, we've seen wars, um, markets and people, as I said, evolve. Uh, and some of, the, some of the best returns that you can generate are actually starting to invest and taking advantage of these opportunities as and when they present themselves. But only do that by focusing on quality. We haven't gone away and bought lots of poor quality businesses that their share prices have fallen. We want to invest in businesses over the long term. And that one of the best ways to do that is by focusing on quality. So that's all from me. I'm going to stop sharing. Stuart's just reappeared to uh, scare you all. Uh, so uh, over to you, Stuart. I think we've got a few questions. Yeah, there's a couple of questions, Alex. Uh, one came quite early on with regards to the FTSE's high, but people's portfolios are still in negative territory. I think you answered that with a couple of the slides, but do you just want to reiterate the reasons why? Because I know when people see the FTSE and all the headlines that are in the UK and the BBC say the FTSE's performing well and it's up at 7.6. Yeah. They see, they've not seen that reflected in the portfolio, so do you just want to quickly touch on that? Yeah, so um, we invest globally. Um, we don't just invest in, in the UK stock market. So I suppose the first point to make is we invest across different asset classes bonds, alternatives, equities, and cash. They're the four main asset classes that we invest in. Um, within the equity allocation that we have, roughly half our allocation is to the UK at the moment. Um, half is not invested in the UK. And, and when the UK has been the FTSE 100 has been the best performing stock market, then, then clearly half of that's working, working fine. Um, we also, within our UK allocation, invest down the market cap spectrum and mid and small cap companies as well. So don't just focus in on the FTSE 100. And as I touched on, despite the fact the FTSE is up 3% uh, this year, the FTSE 250, which invests in that next level of companies is down 10%. Um, so it's not been all good news for UK investors. Um, so, so they're the predominant reasons why really. I mean, bonds, uh, Government bonds falling eight percent in the quarter. It was actually the worst ever quarter from a, to, for to be a bond investor uh, ever on record uh, because of the fact that interest rates are going up and inflation. Um, so 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 yeah, bonds are there for, for for your safe haven status, and they've been under pressure as well. There, there's really been the FTSE 100 has been the only hiding place that you've really had from an investment perspective. And as I said, the reason why the FTSE's done so well is because of the exposure to, to banks, which do well in the interest rate environment uh, and commodities, whether that be oil or, or more miners like Rio and, and Glencore and the businesses like that. 
Now, there's another question here about Russia potentially defaulting um, on, on their debt. What would be the impact in the uh, worldwide economy with that, please, Alex? I think, I think investors are sort of expecting that now, to be honest. Um, uh, Russia's defaulted in the past. Um, from, Russia is actually one of the countries with a very low debt to GDP ratio compared to the UK at the moment. They were paying down their debt to, over the last five, 10 years. So they're actually in a very strong situation. Russian debt, though, and Russian equity markets are a very, very small percentage of the global stock market and the global bond market. We did the analysis straight away in March to see how much of a, a lunar portfolio is invested in, in Russia. And it was less than 0.3% or something. It was like 0.1% that was invested in Russia. Um, and they were through the emerging market funds that we've allocated to. And most funds, most products now that had any Russian exposure have pretty much written them off to zero. They're not expecting those companies to, to pre present a value in the future because of sanctions and everything else that's going on. So the impact from a investor perspective should be low. Uh, and it's already been priced into asset classes uh, already. Yeah, good. Something that might not have been priced in, but should be um, a Tory leadership challenge and, and the effect that this will have on any growth seen in the domestic markets. So, well, I think it was 36 times Boris Johnson said sorry for uh, yesterday in Parliament and he's still right. being held. So let's keep it unpolitical. Uh, unpolitical. Um, stock markets are very unfrequently impacted by what's going on political noise i mean back to that long-term chart of investing in the FTSE all share we've had lots of different parties been in power lots of different prime ministers been in power over that time period businesses are in control of their own destiny to a certain extent and clearly they have to work within the political rules and the, the framework that we have um so will, would stock markets be impacted i don't think so um the area that could be impacted by any uh, leadership challenge is, is probably sterling because sterling's a better barometer of what's going on with, with from a uk pol po political perspective that's what happened when brexit came through as well you saw sterling impacted more so um i don't know if it'd be a positive or negative impact at the moment if uh, there was a political leader leadership challenge in sterling um i think the impact on, on on uk assets will be very minimal in that situation and i didn't know it was 36 times so thank you for educating me on that I was only told that, I don't really know myself. Um, and the last question, there was little mention of China, little mention, excuse me, of China, but it's gone a little bit quiet of late. Are you expecting um, any influence with regards to the global economics or geopolitical influence from that direction at any it, time soon? Yeah, yeah it's, 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 a, it's a great question because China is very political globally nowadays with their ties to Russia, but also they're closely watching what's going on with the Ukraine because of the you know, potential um, ideas in terms of Taiwan as well. Um, I think they may have been surprised by the sanctions that have come through. Um, and China is a lot more reliant on global, global finance than, than Russia was. So I think maybe that's pushed that back. There's also leadership in China this year, um, which I don't think they want to cause too much volatility ahead of that. I think China has been a difficult situation to be invested over the last year or so because the impact from the government in terms of the education sector, the technology sector, uh, and then clearly you've had the um, property issues as well within uh, China and, and, and companies defaulting. You've now got this zero COVID policy. Um, so fortunately, from our perspective, we, we, we weren't big investors in China over the last year, and it's been a good thing because china and asian and emerging markets have been some of the weakest um, stock markets over the last year but all uh, all investments have a value um and there are opportunities that present themselves and as i said we we, we haven't seen the falls but could we therefore look to reinvest in china or asia and emerging markets to to benefit from from any potential rise that comes through and if you go back to my analogy of what happened within the uk during covid 23rd of March being the low of the stock market, 23rd of March being the day that uh, Boris Johnson stood up to say that we were going into restrictions. Well, China now have today announced that Shanghai is starting to ease restrictions. 
Um, so there is starting to be some more positive news coming out of China. Um, stock markets are falling along the way. The, the, the market looks quite cheap. It's something that we're actively discussing here at the moment, um, whether we start to look to increase our exposure to the region. Having not suffered the falls, can we benefit from the rise of, of the stock market? That's something that we are uh, live discussing at the moment, it's, but it just feels a little bit too early from our perspective right now. Good. Uh, thank you, Alex. That's all the questions. Um, thanks for taking time to answer those. I would just like to mention um, at Pareto, we look to ensure that all of our clients' funds are invested in a well-diversified portfolio um, with all of our investment par partners with the aim of maximising the tons and trying to mitigate volatility. I'd like to reiterate what Alex said in terms of we should be conscious of short-term volatility. However, this shouldn't be at the expense of clients' long-term needs and objectives. So again, I'd like to thank you all for your time today for dialing in um, and Alex, your time for presenting. The next quarterly investment seminar hopefully will be on the 20th of July at 10 a.m. Um, if we have an interim, it means that something's happened and the markets have had a reaction. So let's hope we uh, don't speak until July. If there's anything that you would like to discuss um, or any of your clients would like to discuss, please feel free to speak to your individual advisor um, or alternatively, come through to myself and we at Pareto will assist you where possible. So thank you all for your day, uh, time, sorry, and I hope you all have a good day. Thank you, everyone. All the best. Have a lovely day. Take care.